ओके सो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन सो देर इज़ अ क्वेरी फ्राम सवन रिगार्डिंग वेयर टू लाइक रिगार्डिंग द पेपर पैटर्न सो फॉर एनी लॉजिस्टिकल क्वेरीज लाइक लॉजिस्टिक रिलेटेड क्वेरीज यू कैन गो टू द स्वयं पोर्टल एंड देर इज़ द क्यू एन ए सेक्शन ओवर हियर विच विल रीडिरेक्ट यू टू गूगल ग्रुप वेर इन यू कैन आस्क यूर क्वेरीज एंड वन ऑफ द टीम मेम्बर्स लाइक हु is handling the course logistics will be able to answer your queries relating to any uh uh thing related to course so yeah please let me know like uh, if anything is not clear so yeah definitely amit you can put your query over here and uh, probably like someone from the course uh, team will be able to answer your query sure sure thank you yeah. thank you so much Okay, so are there any queries from the previous session? So just to uh, do a brief recap, uh, we saw confusion matrix. Like uh, we first of all saw what uh, terms are, like what these terminologies are: true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. And then uh, we moved on to the concept of confusion matrix. and after that uh, we saw like for different thresholds we will be getting different values of uh, true positives true negatives false positives and false negatives so how do we visualize this like and identify a proper threshold such that uh, uh like you can decide upon like uh, depending on the problem at hand which particular threshold to be selected so for that we saw the usage of receiver operating characteristic curves and then we saw like how this can be used this application can be used for logistic regression model like wherein you will have to set certain threshold and like you will have to change the threshold and see how uh, this matrix are getting changed and then we got introduced to certain matrix like uh, sensitivity specificity uh, precision recall and so on so are there any queries relating to any of these topics Uh, there was one more uh, query actually last in the last session like regarding regression model and regression equation okay let me just search it over here so regression model is basically uh, your population pa- uh, the e- uh, the equation the expression containing population parameters beta 1 and beta 2 so it is beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 and so on plus some error term so that is your regression model and the regression equation okay let me uh, so whatever uh uh equation that you estimate from the given sample that is okay let me show it on an ipad maybe that will be more clear so y equal to beta not sorry beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus so on plus constant term beta not plus some error term so these are all the population parameters and this is the actual y okay so this is the uh, regression model which also contains the error term and the regression equation is what you estimate from the given sample so you uh, you might be given some sample and you estimate this coefficients over there so this is the estimated y and this is the actual y that is getting computed using the population parameter like equation containing the population parameter okay so this is the difference so this is a regression model and this is regression equation so this was the dif- uh, di- difference in the terminologies so this was th- some terminology related question there was one question in uh, in the previous week's question slide so yeah and there is one more thing i uh, di- could not discuss last time was how to compute this uh, measures like specificity spe- uh, sensitivity and so on 
for multi class problem like you had this confusion matrix say actuals and predicted class let's say 0 and class 1 so 0 getting 0 uh, uh, so let's say 0 is our positive class or let me uh, generally we uh, note it as 1 so true positive true negative false negative and false positive so what was our specificity can someone say specificity sensitivity okay somebody answer it's okay yeah specificity is true negative upon true negative plus false positive that is true and what about sensitivity Okay, I'll just may, uh, make a diagram over here. Sorry. So, this is true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. So, specificity says out of all the total negatives, like these are all the negative samples, how many are getting correctly classified as negative? okay so this was specificity and sensitivity was out of all the positives how many are getting correctly classified as positive so how will be the expression for that anyone true positive plus true positive a uh, true positive upon true positive positive plus false negative yes so this is sensitivity so these are the two terms that we saw in the last class but the constraint was this was two class problem like only uh, two classes were getting considered like you had a positive class and a negative class what if you have multiple uh, classes any guesses like uh, how we compute sensitivities in such cases or specificity or any other measure say let's say you have three classes zero one two so these are the actual labels and the predicted labels okay so any intuition or idea like on how to compute uh, these measures for multi-class problem Uh, anyone any random case like how will you do that okay so uh, like here the trick is you consider one class as your positive class and the remaining all the classes as your negatives so it is one versus all okay so if this is positive positive getting classified as positive so this is true positive positive getting classified as negative false negative false positive and doesn't matter the confusion within this uh, negatives but the negatives are getting classified as negatives so this is uh, the overall uh, uh, though there is a problem on this side like uh, true negatives like one might be getting confused with two or so on but here we are uh, concerned about z whether zero is getting confused with the other two classes or not so here we are taking zero as a positive class and then uh, other two as negative class similarly 
you can in the other run you can take one as the positive class and the rest two as the negative class and then compute true positives false positives and so on for that particular class and similarly two as the positive and the other two as the negative so you will have three sensitivities separate sensitivities uh, specificities for each of these categories uh, like there are uh, studies in the literature like uh, uh, which suggest that you can uh, refer these three sensitivities uh, like uh, mention these three sensitivities differently uh, that is the uh, one way and then if you want to combine them that is like uh, you can do it using uh, some sort of weighted averaging like you will have certain weight for each of the class so you can do a weighted average of all these sensitivities to get a uh, get a get an uh, get a weighted average uh, sensitivity score and similarly for specificity precision recall recall and sensitivity sensitivity are nothing but the same uh, like for other any other measures like even for accuracy uh, you can use uh, weighted accuracy uh, we generally use uh, uh, like uh, non weighted accuracies so uh, like does anyone remember like what will be the accuracy formula for uh, like with respect to these measures in the confusion matrix true positives false positives and other things so what will be my accuracy generally the non weighted accuracy in terms of true positives false positives false negatives and true negatives so accuracy is correctly predicted upon total uh, samples so how many are correctly predicted anyone uh, you can put it in chat or unmute and answer or uh, tp upon uh, tp plus fp uh, are you sure uh, it's only tp uh, tp plus tn okay tp plus tn upon actual is uh, tp plus fp no it's not actual it's total number of data points total number of data points yeah so how many are correctly predicted upon total number of data points is your accuracy okay so tp plus fp plus fn plus tn yes exactly yeah so this will be your accuracy but this is non weighted accuracy because so what is happening over here so there will be like say some 5 points in uh, true positives and 100 points in true negatives and so on and let's say you had like around 20, 200 data points and some of them might be in false positives and false negatives so what you are doing over here you are doing like for each of the sample you are dividing it by 200 so it's like all these uh, five true positives divided by 200 and then this uh, negative samples divided by 200 so you are equally weighting them here so this is like uh, not like a uh, weighted average based on class weights so in literature you might find certain averaging techniques in which they use the class weight as the average measure like to find the average uh, that might be needed for the problem at hand so you, um, I'll urge you all like to go and read about this uh, weighted metrics more. Like uh, these are called weighted metrics or measures. So weighted uh, accuracy, precision, recall, and so on. So do read more about it. So this was just for your information. Uh, I'm not sure like if. Uh, multi-class problem was covered in the lectures in Swayam portal so yeah please do look into it okay so this was about confusion matrix receiver operating characteristic curve Okay, we, uh, I won't go into the details of everything in this session. Uh, so we'll move on to the topics of uh, week 10. And uh, 
we'll be discussing chi square test so there are two uh, problems that uh, can be addressed using chi square test so first one is uh, chi square test for independence uh, and then there is chi square test for goodness of fit type okay so that is uh, the, these are the two applications and then we'll move on to cluster analysis we will touch upon cluster analysis and we'll discuss uh, in detail about the different types of clustering there are like k means uh, supervised unsupervised and like in that also like in unsupervised there are there is like k means clustering and then you have hierarchical clustering uh, clusterings and so on so yeah we'll discuss all these things in detail later so first of all let us see uh, how chi square test is used to see the independence like check for independence so let me go back to ipad again okay so far any queries uh, regarding any of the previous week topics Uh, we can discuss the, that uh, as well like if you have any queries uh, maybe towards the end of this session okay so let us see say uh, in the so le let us recall all the tests we have done so far so for one single sample uh, like you had this like null hypothesis whether the sample mean was equal to something or not so in that case what test did we use we had uh, conditions like you know the population standard deviation or not so to compare the mean of uh, a single uh, sam like pop sample coming from a single population so what may, uh, test did you use so yeah let me go over there directly so it was z test either or t test depending on the sample size and the uh, like knowledge about the population parameter that is standard deviation population standard deviation so and to compare the means of two uh, like uh, samples coming from two populations like say let's say it is having mu1 and mu2 so our null hypothesis was mu1 equal to mu2 and alternate hypothesis mu1 not equal to mu2 depending on the problem at hand mu1 greater than mu2 or so on so in this case also we use two sample test t test uh, if the population uh, again there were like multiple cases like when the population uh, standard deviations were known uh, we use z test then if the uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 were non not known then we computed sigma 1 uh, s1 one, s2 one, for each of the populations and then computed the pooled sample variance or like assuming that the variance of this particular two populations are same or uh, we estimated s1 s2 separately and then computed the degrees of freedom for the t statistic uh, to be computed so in that case we had z test and two sample t test again and coming to three or more like uh, each one having its own mean three or more populations like samples from three or more population so what was the so our null hypothesis was mu1 equal to mu2 equal to mu3 and alternate hypothesis was mu1 not equal to mu2 not equal to mu3 okay so what was the statistical test that we used in this case so this is the question so for this we use z test or t test here also z test uh, t test depending on the yeah exactly that's the correct answer so for here uh, in this case we used anova okay so this was about the means the difference of the mean or the assignment of the mean then we had one more uh, entity called proportion similarly here for the single sample we use z proportion test here also we use some sort of uh, similar sort of test for two samples and what is the test that we are going to use now for three or more 
uh, populations like proportions coming from three or more populations so here in this case we are going to use chi square test so how do we do that first of all we will be having certain data with us let's say uh, on data was given in uh, the slides it was on uh, some geographical location region and the financial uh, related stuff i'm not very sure like what exactly that was or financial expenditure or something so let's say you are in any of this geographical region and then you had certain financial expenditures let's say in the urban area you might be having more financial expenditures and so on so and so on like it can be uh, any number of columns and any number of rows depending on the number of uh, entities you have over here okay so there will be certain observed frequencies so say uh, for geographical region a uh, the amount spent on something uh, will be d uh, on some uh, d entity will be some let's say x a d so this is our observed frequency or observed value similarly you will have such observed values for each of these cases and so on now we have to see whether these geographical regions and this particular entities or whatever entities these are whether these are independent or not okay and for that case we use chi square test so how do we find this uh, the first of all in every uh, statistical test the first part is to compute the statistic so in the t in the z test we were computing the statistic using x minus mu by sigma by root n or x minus mu by uh, by sigma by sorry s by root n and so on so this was the first step you will compute the statistic there will be an underlying distribution and then you will try to find like uh, given the level of significance you will have certain critical value or critical region and you will see whether where your test statistic is lying whether it is lying in the critical region or in the uh, acceptance region like uh, uh, where the null hypothesis will be accepted or will not be rejected so similarly over here as well you will have to compute a statistic called chi square test chi square statistic and it will be having a chi square distribution again chi square is a distribution with uh, the parameters degree of freedom okay let me show it to you on browser let us see so you can see over here i hope my screen is visible so these are the chi square distributions and you'll see one parameter over here k that is the degree of freedom okay so it is having one parameter and you can see different shapes of uh, chi square distributions as the parameters change the, or as the degrees of freedom change the shape of the chi square distribution also changes so uh depending on the degrees of freedom and your uh, chi square statistic that you are computing and the significance level that you have you can uh, see whether uh, you are going to reject your null hypothesis or uh, not reject it and the null hypothesis over here is that the proportions of the three uh, like all the entities are the same that is like uh, the across the geographical locations or uh, across the other entities or in the sense like uh, they are not dip, uh, independent that is your null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis is that they are independent sorry uh, the, they are independent sorry uh, am i bad uh, 
let me explain it to you on iPad. So, uh, in the very uh, first or second lecture, we saw some basics of probability. So, uh, what will be the value of intersection B when uh, the two random variables or two uh, sets are independent? What will uh, be P intersection be evaluate uh, getting evaluated to? It will be P of A into P of B. Uh, am I correct? Is everyone with me on this? Okay, fine. So, in the table that we saw, the frequency table, it is also called as contingency table. Okay, so each one will be having certain observed frequency. Let's say this is 1, 1, 1, 2, and so on. So, what will be the proportion of this uh, particular uh, so, let us say this is some value, like we have some value 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 4 and so on. So, the proportion will be the value over here upon uh, all the uh, total total number of values that is O11 plus O12 and so on, okay. That is equal to, so this is the total number of data points or the values. So, this is your observed uh, frequency and you will be, uh, so for P of A, what will it be? It will be number of elements in A upon total number of elements. Similarly, P of B will be number of elements in B upon total number of elements, okay. So, if A and B are independent, So, it will be n of a upon n into n of b into n. Now, you have this probability over here. So, you want to find out this, uh, you are interested in this frequencies actually, the and not the proportion here. Like, if you want to find the frequency of this, how will you find that? So, you have been given this O11 by n to compute O11, you will have to multiply it by n, right? So, similarly, you have been given this proportion of A intersection B, that is, let's say this is A and this is B. So, to find it out, like uh, out of all the n elements, how many elements are belonging to this particular A and B intersection as per the expectation, like in, in when they are independent. So, for that, you will have to multiply this by capital N to get the proportion, uh, the number of elements belonging to this A intersection B when they are independent. So, that is our expected observer or uh, frequency. So, it will be N into Na Nb upon N square. So, it will be Na Nb upon N. Okay. So, this, this is observed frequency is given frequencies are given to us and we are computing this expected frequencies okay so your chi square statistic will be observed frequencies minus expected frequency square upon expected frequency for all the data points like this is summing over uh, rows and columns so, you have this chi-square value, you have been given the significance level alpha, 
So, you can compute the chi square corresponding to this alpha and the degrees of freedom. So, how do you compute degrees of freedom in this case? So, degrees of freedom will be number of rows minus 1 into number of columns minus 1. Okay, so you have this degree of freedom, you have the alpha value, you can compute the chi-square alpha and degree of freedom, you will get the critical value. So this will be your critical value, critical chi-square value. And this will be your computed chi-square value based on the data given to you. So if chi-square, let's say this is the chi-square distribution, this is your critical chi-square value and if your chi-square value, computed chi-square value lies beyond this. So what it means is it go uh, like uh, uh, we are going to reject our null hypothesis. Okay. Which means they are not independent. In case the chi-square value lies, the computed chi-square value lies over here be, be, uh, before this critical chi-square. So in that case, we are failing to reject a null hypothesis. Okay, so this is the basic step that uh, we are doing in the chi-square uh, independence test. Is this process clear so far? Let us see uh, some examples uh, from Professor Ramesh's slides which will make it uh, clearer. So let me stop the share over here. Okay, so this was the example given over there. So the region in which uh, the person is residing and the financial investment that the person is making. So whether these entities are independent or not, that was the problem at hand. And then uh, we talked about uh, the independence and the expected frequencies and the observed frequencies and the chi-square statistic. Okay, so the first step in this is to compute the expected frequencies for each of these uh, entries and then so how will be the expected frequencies calculated? The number of uh, elements belonging to this category A which will be the row sum over here Na, number of elements belonging to category E which will be the uh, uh, column sum over here and divided by the total number of uh, elements or total value over here, observed values. Okay. Similarly, you will find it out for each of these entries. So that will be your expected frequency. You have been given the observed frequencies and you will compute this uh, particular chi-square statistic with degrees of freedom R minus 1 into row column minus 1. That is row minus 1 and column minus 1. Okay. I think I used uh, a different notation over here, OF and EF. Uh, but this is the standard notation that is used and people also use capital O, capital E I think in this case. Okay, so here was an example that was given. So the uh, null hypothesis was type of gasoline is independent of income. So uh, there are different types of gasoline like different levels of gasoline and then uh, uh, the null hypothesis was that if the person is having certain income uh, in any of these ranges, whether this income is independent of type, uh, whether this type of gasoline that is being purchased by people is independent of their income. Like if the people are having like higher income, are they purchasing extra premium version of gasoline or not? So this independence had to be tested and for this we are using this chi-square test. So first of all, degrees of freedom. So here we had four income uh, 
labels or categories and then three uh, types of gasolines so the degrees of freedom will be r minus 1 into like row minus 1 into column minus 1 which is 4 minus 1 into 3 minus 1 which is 6 over here and then the level of significance that was given to us was 0.01 uh, in literature you might find like uh, 0.01 or 0.05 like 0 0.05 is the most frequent one like is generally used but 0 0.01 and other uh, significance levels are also used so for this you will be having certain standard uh, critical chi-square value for a given degrees of freedom so you can refer to the chi-square table if that is provided to you or uh, yeah it can be computed using python so we'll see some python code basic python code to do this but this is like the theoretical, theoretical uh, background of this uh, chi-square test of independence so first step find the given you have been given this table contingency table you have been given the observed values sorry you have been given the observed value you will have to find the uh, expected value based on the frequencies like the number of elements in a that are there in total number of elements in b e uh, category e uh, uh, in, and the total number of elements so once you find this you will have to compute the chi square statistic given the uh, significance level you will have to find the uh, critical value and then compare your uh, computed chi square statistic with the uh, critical uh, uh, value so if the ca calculated chi square is greater than critical value then you are going to re reject the uh, null hypothesis and if it is not then you are failing to re reject your null hypothesis okay we'll see this part in the uh, collab notebook okay and here are the computations so you have your observed frequencies you sum them up you get the number of elements for each of these particular categories okay and then uh, you will be computing the expected frequencies and then this is the chi-square value uh, getting computed as the observed frequency minus expected frequency square divided by expected frequency and summing it over all the uh, cells that you have over here and depending on where it lies you are going to reject your null hypothesis okay so is this part clear to everyone like how we are doing this chi square uh, test of independence okay thanks uh, if it is not clear please let me know like i'll explain it again okay and then there are multiple uh, other examples given in this like uh, whether the use of left or high, uh, like hand preference uh, for writing uh, if it is dependent on gender or not so whether these two are independent or not that was another example that was discussed so there are other examples multiple other examples like object to sharing record uh, uh, to record sharing and then organization whether it depend uh, whether these things are independent or not and so on so yeah there are ample of examples over here you can uh, look into them and try to solve them you yourself theoretically or manually and then we'll move on to python after this so uh, let us see what all is there in the other lecture okay so there was this one more example so a uh, data was collected from 50 students we'll see this example in python as well and then uh, the uh, there were uh, different entities over here like the registration number academic ability that was like uh, the academic ability was quantitatively found using some test or something then the level of parent education the student motivation religion gender and so on so all this data was given and we had like uh, the task was like that was discussed over here like whether uh, two entities are independent or not like for example gender and the uh, student motivation so whether the student motivation is dependent on gender or not so same thing like from the task here like was uh, uh, tricky over here because you have been given this data in this format and 
if you want to find out whether the student motivation is independent of gender or student motivation is depend independent of the academic ability or so on you will have to first of all compute the contingency table for that so for that uh, uh, we'll be seeing how you can do it in python uh, but once you have this contingency table then the latest steps are same exactly the same you will have to find out the expected frequencies and then compute the chi square statistic given the level of significance you will have to uh, decide whether to reject or accept your null hypothesis okay so this was all about chi square test of independence so are there any queries about this we will see this in python So let us go to note Python notebook. I'll just upload the data over here. So you can find this data in the important data section over here, important data files in the week 10 section. And for those of you who are joining for the first time, uh, I'll be sharing all these notebooks in the Google Drive folder and the link to the Drive folder is also available, will also be available in the video description uh, where I'll be like on my YouTube channel. So you can go to the video description and you'll find a link over here which will redir redirect you to a Google Drive folder and you will find all the material that I'm using over here. Okay, so as usual, we'll be importing some necessary libraries, and this data was given the, in this acad.xl file. So the data from fifty students. It's uh, starting from zero, indexing over here. So this data is provided to us. The any you can do any task like whether any two entities are. Uh, independent or not so here I'm just taking gender and student motivation motivation you can also take any other uh, columns over here so I'll be sharing this notebook with you you can play around with it okay so first task was like given this so we have read this particular uh, excel file in a panda data frame in Python and we are using this data frame to create a contingency table for gender and student motivation. So these are the values given to it 0, 1, 2 and 0, 1, uh, 0 being male and 1 being female and uh, other way around. So uh, you have to find out this contingency table and for that we are using this function in uh, Python uh, pandas library pivot table. So what this pivot table does, it takes the columns, uh, gender and student motivation and then converts that to a contingency table and you are giving this index over here. So index G, it is like for the rows and index uh, for the columns, it is SM, okay. So this particular thing will find out the frequency of each of this like uh, things like the number of students having gender uh, let's say zero it can be male or female anything and student motivation zero as per this table so what is the frequency of that table uh, particular category gender zero and student motivation zero so you will be having certain frequency in each of these entries or cells over here and then you will have to do chi-square test of independence to see whether this two entities gender and student motivation are independent and for that we have okay so uh, in scipy.stats we have this chi-square contingency uh, sub module which you can use to uh, do this chi-square uh, analysis so whatever contingency table we have we can pass it on to this chi-square contingency and it will compute the chi-square value, the p value, the degrees of freedom and the contingency table uh, of expected values for us. So 
I already ran it. I'll just rerun it for you. So, as I said, like you can either compute the critical value for chi square, uh, uh, like distribution given the significance level, and the degrees of freedom. Let me just show that as well. So you have this chi square distribution. You have computed the so you have been given alpha. Let's say it is 0 0.05, and let's say the degrees of freedom, which is number of rows into no, my into uh, minus one into number of columns minus one over here. Let's say it's uh, some x. Uh, it can be anything. The shape of the chi-square distribution will change accordingly because that is the parameter of this chi-square distribution. And given uh, this, you compute the critical value. Okay, this alpha is this area under the curve, 0 0.05. So this particular area will be 0.95. And given this, you can compute this critical value. So now you have this computed chi square, like the calculated chi square, depending on the data you have at hand. Uh, if it lies somewhere over here, so the p value will be area under the curve beyond that particular chi square, computed chi square value. Okay, so if this p value is less than the level of uh, significance that is alpha. So in that case, you are going to reject your null hypothesis. So what I said earlier was just comparing the critical chi-square value and the computed chi-square value. But you can also uh, uh, do the hypothesis testing as we discussed in any of the previous sessions for different types of tests. You can either use p-value approach or critical value approach. Either way will give you the same result. Okay, so in the so let me stop the share over here. So in this case, you are uh, so this chi-square contingency function is directly computing the chi-square value the uh, p value the degrees of freedom based on these uh, shape of the matrix and the exp uh, table for the expected frequencies so the chi square value we are getting over here is 2.36 uh, here we got the p value of 0 0.30 which is greater than 0 0.05 or whatever level of significance we have hence we are going to uh, uh, accept our null hypothesis or fa we fail to reject our do not reject our null hypothesis and degrees of freedom in this case was 2 because we were having 2 rows and 3 columns so it will be 2 minus 1 into 3 minus 1 which is 2 and this is the expected frequency table which is computed using like so n n n0 into n0 or uh, like the row sum column sum divided by the total sum similarly row sum column sum row sum column sum divided by total sum and so on so chi square internally it is computing uh, the expected uh, like the actual frequency 10 minus 8.12 square divided by 8.12 plus 13 minus 12.76 square divided by 12.76 and so on and using that uh, the sky square statistic is computed and using this sky square this particular p value is computed okay so is this particular part clear to everyone uh, is it clear how we did that in python
for those of you who joined a little late uh, yeah so we are discussing the chi square test of independence so is this part clear uh, you want me to repeat what we have done uh, yes alpita uh, you have any question oh miss the initial part uh, uh, from where did you miss uh, ravi uh, yeah alpita you uh, please go ahead Huh. Just uh, repeat the thing. Uh, how to use the chi square in a Python? I I am uh, conceptually clear about the chi square test uh, and statistics and all the calculation. Okay. But uh, the, all the library uh, and the, how to input the data and all these things, uh, I have to just know that. I see. I see. Okay. okay. So for I think uh, somebody just joined ten minutes back. Okay. I'll quickly recap what we did in the chi square test of independence. Uh, the very first step was to compute so you will be given the contingency table so contingency table is nothing but the table of frequencies that is the observed frequencies let me just go to an example over here so this is the way you will be given so you have been given some income categories and then you have been given some uh, labels for other categories and then uh, you have this frequency like the people having less than 30000 salary dollar 30000 salary and who are purchasing this regular type of gasoline uh, there are 85 such people and so on like uh, you will for every category uh, you will be having certain frequency of people and then uh, you have to compute so we want to test what is chi-square test doing over here we want to see like whether this particular income uh, like if the income value is in independent or the if the type of gasoline being purchased is independent of the income uh, of the people so uh, what we saw earlier when the two variables are independent or two random variables are independent or two say subsets are independent so in that case uh, their intersection the probability of intersection of two sets over here a intersection b will be probability of a into probability of f okay so this is what we saw in the very beginning like in the probability uh, basics and then how we compute the probability of a it is number of elements in a divided by n a total number of elements and similarly for f it is number of elements in f divided by total number of elements so using this particular formula you computed we computed this uh, probability of a intersection f so now we have this probability to get the actual number of data points in this particular intersection like a and f you will have to multiply it by uh, capital N which is the total number of data points so this is giving you the proportion so out of all these n data points this is the proportion of uh, data points which are belonging to a intersection f theoretically that is expected so you will be getting one expected value of uh, uh, this particular intersection that is a and b similarly for each of this like uh, entries over here you will compute the expected value for uh, I'm, I'm repeating this for those who just joined and then once you have this you will compute the chi-square statistic that is the observed frequency minus expected frequency square divided by expected frequency and sum it over all the rows uh, all the cells over here so this is how you compute the chi-square uh, uh, statistic and based on the degrees of freedom that is the row minus one and column minus one and uh, the significance level you will do the hypothesis testing to decide whether to reject or the null hypothesis or not okay so in python uh, here we just did some basic stuff so we imported pandas for read specifically for reading the data frame uh, like da reading data from the excel file into a data frame so this data set was given to us which contains uh, uh, different parameters like the academic ability of student, the parentification of parentification level of student, student motivation, uh, which is having uh, only three values zero and two. Then uh, some other uh, uh, like entities over here like gender, religion, and so on. Uh, gender is having only two values over here zero and one. So uh, using chi-square test we can find out whether this academic ability is ex uh, independent of student motivation or the parent education level is uh, independent of 
or the academic ability is independent of the parent education level of the students uh, like uh, of the pa parents of the students and so on so to compare any two things uh, first the first tip will be to get the con contingency table and to get that contingency table we use this pd dot p uh, in pandas library there is this pivot table uh, function in which you are passing this uh, data frames two columns gender and student motivation and you are giving this uh, index uh, to the rows as g and the columns as sm so what is this function doing it is creating a contingency table which is containing the frequencies of or the observed frequencies of these categories like gender being zero uh, male or female and student motivation being zero so once you get this we use this cypher.stats module in that we have this chi square contingency function so you pass this uh, obtained uh, contingency table into this particular chi square contingency function which will return four values first is chi square statistic which we were manually computing in this cases like using this formula the p value which is nothing but the area under the curve for the given chi square uh, statistic uh with the shape of that uh, which is following the chi square distribution and the shape of the distribution will depend upon the degrees of freedom which is decided by the number of rows minus 1 and into number of columns minus 1 and then it will also return the table of expected frequencies okay so given the level of significance alpha let's say 0.05 uh, we can compare it with the obtained uh, p value and in this case we can see that the p value that we are getting is greater than 0.05 which means uh, we don't have sufficient statistical uh, evidences to reject the null hypothesis so we fail to reject a null hypothesis in this case so is it clear everyone now for those of you who had query so what is the tbl in that uh, uh, tbl uh, is your uh, uh, table of expected frequencies so if you see over here <laughs> got it the e yeah, the e, 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 e uh, g a, a g and so on so the way you uh, you are like you will be computing it using the number of elements uh, for that particular category so that is your expected frequencies got it got it yeah okay so this was all about chi square test of independence we uh, there is one more application of chi square test and that is used for uh, goodness of fit so what is this goodness of fit problem okay uh, can anybody answer like uh, those of you who might have gone through the lectures oh why do we have two rows on contingency table okay because uh, there were only two such uh, okay let me just show it to you over here so the gender was taking only two values zero and one so that's why the number of rows is two over here and the student motivation was taking this so in this data if you see the gender is given only two values 0 1 0 being male or female and 1 being other way around and student motivation is also having only three values 0 1 2 so it depends on the values that you have like for example in this case uh, there were four such cases like four such categories less than 30,000 and so on and here three categories so it depends on the categories you have at hand Okay. Any other query? Okay. So, uh, going back to the chi-square uh, goodness of fit. Okay. Let me just open this particular slide. So, goodness of fit test 
is used to uh, see like given certain data you want to find out whether that data follows a certain distribution or not so for that we use this chi square goodness of fit test and we'll see some examples over here i'll refer to the slides only and uh, let us see so in this case as well you will be computing expected frequency and the way you compute expected frequency is different here in this case it will be dependent on the kind of distribution you are assuming the data is following and observed frequencies are the frequencies that are like uh, given to you in the data and the degrees of freedom that this chi square statistic uh, will be fo uh, like following uh, like the dis chi square distribution this chi square t statistic belongs to will be uh, given as k minus 1 minus p where k is the number of categories you have and p is the number of parameters of the uh, distribution you are assuming so for example for uh, normal distribution how many parameters are there can anyone answer yeah that's correct two and then for uh, poisson distribution how many parameters Uh, are you sure it is 3 yeah it's 1 that is lambda so Poisson distribution is x to the power lambda e to the power minus lambda upon x factorial so lambda is the only parameter we have yeah so and for uniform distribution uniform distribution is a continuous distribution so how many parameters are there yeah that's correct it's zero parameter okay so your degrees of freedom will depend on the number of data points or categories given to you and the parameters of the distribution that uh, underlying distribution you are assuming okay so the null hypothesis in this case is population has Poisson probability distribution in this case we are uh, seeing the goodness of fit test for Poisson distribution like given the data we have to see like whether the population has like we are assuming the data that is given to us is a population data and uh, the null hypothesis over here is population has a Poisson pro probability distribution and uh, alternate hypothesis would be other way around so first of all let me uh, skip all these things over here yeah so this is the kind of data that is given to us so here are arrivals and this is the frequency so for a, in one minute uh, you uh, you have one arrival and such cases are occurring one number of time in one minute two arrivals such cases were observed four number of times in one minute three arrivals such cases were observed three number of times and so on this is what uh, uh, this data sh uh, explains so the here the arrivals are like the number of cars entering the garage during a one minute interval and the null hypothesis is that these arrivals are uh, like the number of cars are points are distributed and the alternate hypothesis is it is not points are distributed so I think it's like directly going into the code but before we go into the code uh, let us first understand the theory of it so we have been given this data first of all the first step will be to estimate the parameter theoretically of the Poisson distribution and the parameter is lambda it is also uh, uh, not a, uh, like uh, this notation of nu is also used uh, in literature for lambda so it's the same thing so your Poisson distribution will look like e to the power minus mu upon x factorial mu to the power x okay so the first thing is we have these arrivals we have the frequencies so the mean will be the total number of uh, uh, cars divided by the arrivals the total arrivals over here so it will be like 0 into 0 plus 1 into 1 uh, plus 2 into 4 plus 3 into 10 and so on 
divided by the uh, total number over here that is 100. So, you will be getting the estimated value of uh, uh, mean from this data and then uh, once you have this parameter computed, you can compute the uh, f of x which is 6 to the power x e to the power minus 6 upon x factorial. Okay. So, what are the values of x that uh, are given over here? 0, 1, 2 up to 12. So, for each of this, you will be having this expected uh, f of x that is the that is equivalent to the probability that we were finding in the case of uh, independence test probability of A intersection B. And once you have this expected probability or the uh, probability ma from the probability mass function that is f of x, uh, you can compute the expected frequency over here. Uh, using n that is similar to what we were doing over there. We were finding the probability and multiplying it with the total number of elements. Similarly over here, we are trying to find the para estimate the parameters of the underlying distribution. If it were like normal distribution, there is a tricky part in the case of normal distribution. We will see that if time permits, but, uh, uh, but the uh, thing is that given this data, whatever data you have been given, we will have to first of all compute the parameters, population parameters. In the case of normal distribution, it will be mean and the standard deviation. In the case of Poisson distribution, it is only this mean over here. So, once you compute this mean, you can compute f of x for each of these uh, in, uh, random values, uh, random variable values. And uh, uh, once you have this f of x, you have the total number of uh, arrivals. So, you can compute the frequency of each expected frequencies for each of this uh, uh, random variable value. And once you have the expected frequencies and the observed frequencies over here, you can compute this chi square statistic as observed frequency minus expected frequency square upon expected frequency with degrees of freedom equal to k minus 1 minus p. In this case, k is equal to 12 or 13 I think and then uh, the number of parameters are 1. So, it will be 13 minus 1 minus 1. Okay. So, uh, once you have this chi square statistic computed depending on the uh, level of significance and the degree of freedom, you can decide upon whether to reject or accept the null hypothesis. This was an overview of uh, chi square uh, goodness of fit test. So, is this part clear to everyone? Uh, is it clear or you want me to repeat? I see people are leaving. Uh, I hope you are not getting bored by me. Anyone, uh, you got it or you want me to explain it again? We will see your Python example. Okay, yeah, let me repeat it or maybe later uh, let me uh, show it to you on Python, uh, maybe that will make it clear. Okay. okay, so this was about independence test. So, we have this example. So, here also like uh, we are importing necessary libraries like uh, for chi square distribution, we have uh, this chi square module over here. So, in scipy.stats for Poisson distribution, we have this Poisson module and then uh, NumPy for any other processing that might be needed later. So, first of all, we are getting this data. So, this data is stored in pd p underscore distribution dot excel. We are reading that data into a data frame and we have this arrivals and frequencies. So, by the way, like there is one constraint that needs to be taken into account, uh, I, which I forgot to tell that this goodness of fit test works when you have at least uh, uh, like uh, five uh, elements in the observed frequencies. So, that was the constraint that was mentioned in the lectures. So, we will stick to that. So, uh, 
they in that case like they were like com clubbing up all these uh, frequencies or uh, these categories such that the fre observed frequencies is at least 5 in this case so that's why you are seeing over here 5 and then later 10 14 20 and so on and then all these things like uh, at the end uh, 10 11 12 these were also combined to get uh, the value of 10 over here okay so this was the observed frequency and the expected frequency these are uh, computed uh, manually but we'll see how we can do it uh, using this so i think uh, the code does not explain like how to compute using pmf uh, let me just check yeah here it is so what we are doing over here for each of this uh, arrivals we have first of all computed the mean the parameter mu which is the total arrival so what i am doing over here np dot dot so how many of you know the concept of dot product okay let me explain it to you on uh, ipad maybe it may not be so very clear from uh, the code okay so what we are trying to do over here so you have been given arrivals and the frequency so arrivals were like 0 1 2 3 4 and so on up to 12 and you are given some frequency values uh, let me check what exactly these frequencies were yeah it was 0 1 4 10 and so on till 1 okay so uh, there were zero arrivals uh, in one minute duration and the frequency of such instances were computed one arrival in one minute duration and there were one such uh, there was one such case two arrivals in one minute there were four such cases three arrivals in one minute in, and there were ten such cases and so on so this data was uh, recorded and then on an average lambda had to be computed so lambda will be like arrivals i like this i value i is going from 0 to let's say 12 into frequency of i divided by summation of arrivals okay so once you have this mean computed you can so let me write x to the power lambda upon x factorial sorry lambda to the power x x factorial e to the power minus lambda so using this f of x so what is f of x doing so poisson distribution is having certain uh, so it's a discrete distribution not a continuous distribution but uh, you it might be having certain shape so each of this for each of the random val value like uh, variable say 0 1 2 3 4 up to 12 it will be having certain probability value okay and then we have total frequency uh, total number of arrivals that we have so uh, okay let me just check it uh, if everything is proper over here yeah just a second this is fine okay so you have this lambda computed oh by the way i think i made a mistake over here 
it is not arrival, it is frequency. Yeah, apologies for that. So, you have the total number of arrivals and you have like for this many, uh, for this many cases like uh, arrival, uh, like for this instances where like 0 arrival in 1 minute, 1 arrival in 1 minute, 2 arrival in 1 minute and so on, you had certain frequencies and you computed the probability that is like the frequency of that particular instance divided by the total number of elements. Now, you want to find this frequency, so you will have to divide this probability divided by n and this probability is nothing but this f x, f of x. So, this is the f of x value for this given x i. So, you will be computing f of x i for each of this and if you multiply it by n, you will be getting this particular f i value, the frequency value. Okay. So, once you have this expect, so these are your expected frequencies and you have been given this, these are your observed frequencies and you have expected frequencies. So, you will compute chi square as observed expected frequency minus observed frequency square or other way around it does not matter it is a square upon expected frequency. So, this statistic will be computed using the expected frequency values and the observed frequency values and it will be having the degrees of freedom equal to the number of categories you have in this case it was 13 minus 1 minus p and p is the number of uh, parameters of the distribution and for points of distribution it was only one that is lambda okay so for this de many degrees of freedom and the chi square statistic and the given level of alpha let's say 0 0.05 you can decide uh, whether the null hypothesis is true or not okay and uh, regarding the dot product part of it so we were computing this things right arrival into frequent arrival i into frequency i so this can be also represented as the vector of arrivals 0 1 2 3 so on 12 into uh, this matrix into 1 4 and so on so it is nothing but arrival transpose frequency which and this term is called as dot product for those of you who do not know. So, dot product of two vectors a and b is uh, we call it a uh, uh, scalar product not vector product uh, I think somebody mentioned vector product over here. So, it is called a scalar product. So, its dot product is given as a transpose b. Okay. So, that is what I was using over here there in the python code. Okay. So, yeah. So, total arrivals where np dot dot uh, list of data arrivals. So, it will give me uh, all these arrivals data dot arrival uh, sorry let me show it to you first. So, data arrivals will give me the columns over here of corresponding to arrival and data frequency data of frequency will give me the column corresponding to frequency and if I pass it on to uh, this list it will convert it to list. Okay. So, I have list of data arrivals and list of data frequency. I am taking a dot product of it using this np dot uh, uh, np dot dot function and I will get this numerator value and denominator value is nothing but this particular sum that I have found over here. So, we have this observed frequencies. So, np dot sum. So, I can also write it over here instead of just writing 100 np dot sum observed frequency that is my total time period 
and the mean will be total arrival divided by total time period and that is turning out to be 6 over here in this case. So once we have this, we can compute all the fx. So how to compute fx? That is the probability mass function in case of Poisson distribution. So for any uh, particular value let of random variable say 0 and 6, there will be a certain PMF value. Okay, so you can see over here. So this is uh, this point two four is coming because you are multiplying this points so dot PMF into total time period that is hundred over here in our case. So hundred into this will give you point two four. Similarly, for one, you will get point zero one four something into hundred. It will be one point four eight and so on. So it is computing for all the values. So you will get this expected frequency list of expected frequencies and then uh, what you are doing over here yeah he, the, here we are just rounding it off to two decimal places and then uh, you are clubbing them up over here like these are the expected frequencies and the observed frequencies that we have but as per the constraints uh, you need to have at least five uh, the frequency of five to perform this goodness of fit test so these three categories over here were combined together. Similarly, this last three categories, why, la why not last two? Because if you even if you sum these two, it will be 3 plus 1, 4, which is less than 5. So hence, uh, the third one is also included and these three things were uh, like combined together to get these observed frequencies and the expected frequencies. And then we were passing this particular observed frequencies and expected frequency lists to this scipy.stats.chi-square uh, function uh, to get the chi-square statistic and the corresponding p-value. Okay. Uh, is this part clear? Any query in this? Uh, yeah, I have one query like uh, we converted the arrays to list and then we did the dot uh, yes. NP dot dot. Is there any uh, direct uh, some product kind of function which can work on arrays itself? Uh, I think I'm not very sure like if I, I'll pass it uh, whether it will directly compute it. Let me just check it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did that. Work. So you can directly pass on this uh, array as well like whatever array you are getting from the right. data frame. Yeah. So okay. it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, so now yeah, that's what uh, that was all about the chi square uh, goodness of fit test. And let me go back to slides. So, this was all about chi square test, and you can see more examples in this uh, slides. Uh, please go through uh, other things, like uh, I'm not discussing it over in here now. So, there is like Professor Amish has discussed it for normal distribution as well. So, there, it, there was a trick in that. So first of all, the basic thing was to estimate the parameters of the distribution that is mean and the standard deviation that you can do using uh, uh, yeah, the data that you have at hand. But the later part was a bit tricky. They, uh, since it is a continuous distribution, you will have to have certain discretization. So for that, he used, he divided the uh, total area into six equal parts and depending on the area. So if it is, uh, so for each area, it will be 1 by, so total area is 1. So the area corresponding to each of these blocks will be 1 by 6. So once you have this area under the curve, you can uh, compute the particular z value over here. Like given this area, you can f use this CDF function or like uh, PPF function, so uh, percent point function to find the inverse CDF of this. So you will get this uh, particular value over here. Then you have this total area here. This is two times one zero point one six six seven. So you you have this area. You can compute this x value. You have this area. You can compute this x value, which is nothing but the mean. You have this particular area. You can compute this and so on. So once you have this and the data that is given to you, like uh, this list is given to you thirty three forty three and so on. 
so you can see like how many are falling in this particular category how many in this category and how many in and so on so you will get uh, frequencies for given categories observed frequencies and then you can compute the expected frequencies using normal distribution the similar like uh, similarly uh, as we compute similar to the way that we computed in the case of Poisson distribution that will be f of x into the total number of uh, elements and uh, in this case as it was like uh, uh, equally divided the expected one was like out of all the elements like we had I think 30 elements in that case so everything was getting like 555 five, five elements uh, that was the expected frequency that we got so rest of the uh, steps are like the same so yeah please go through this example and you can play around it with it in python so that was all about uh, chi square goodness of fit test and we'll quickly move on to cluster analysis so are there any queries till now uh, is it clear uh, to everyone so we'll touch upon chi uh, this uh, cluster analysis and see some questions and then we'll end the discussion okay so why do we need cluster analysis that is the question uh, anyone can you answer like uh, first of all what is cluster analysis let's say uh, you cluster data like say you have uh, uh, x's over here and o's over here so you can clearly cluster these two because these are distinct right so why do we need cluster analysis the basic thing is to find the patterns in the data like how many distinct patterns are there okay so let me give you an example uh, you everyone of you would have gone to shopping malls and uh, you would have purchased uh, clothes and you will be finding certain tags on it like the size tag so you will have this x axis s m l xl and so on these tags are given to you uh, given on the brand uh, brands uh, clothes so how do they decide this things so internally like uh, yeah that, that's correct uh, ravi uh, so you are doing grouping over there so how are they deciding this uh, labels so these are decided based on certain factors so what are these factors like what can be these factors uh, let's uh, let's assume any two factors uh, average height of uh, uh, the people living in that area uh, not area means it's independent of area it's just height of the person right height of the person or Waist size Maybe, of the uh, like say in northern part of the country they have an average of six feet height and uh, it is independent country. like uh, the brand sells its products everywhere like so it should be independent of it so what uh, uh, so let's say two hypothetical parameters let's say height and uh, let's say waist size or anything so uh, height and waist size so you will be having for given waist size you have certain uh, height like there are people uh, with this many uh, like this waist size, waist size and uh, these heights so this is uh, this is a continuous variable height is also a continuous variable so they will record this data and based on that they will do certain clustering okay 
So let's say this particular cluster belongs to Xs, this to S, and uh, this to some L or something, and so on. So you will be getting one single uh, size. Uh, it's not like it, they are making a spatial uh, fit for you separately. They are taking like on on an average uh, for this group, what will be the uh, best fit that can be made. So that's how they make these sizes. Like they collect data, a uh, lot of data, cluster them, and then based on that, they decide upon the sizes. So we have the, some standard size chart you will be finding on the online shopping uh, centers or uh, like uh, online platforms so they will be providing you certain size chart and that is like the average on an average that will fit uh, to a certain group of people and they are labeling it as xs or s or so on so they are getting this way uh, data so since it's not a discrete thing like waist size and height is it's not a discrete thing so they are taking all this data clustering them and taking the average of this cluster and making uh, uh, clothes of that particular size and giving them certain label okay so that is uh, just a basic thing like they may not be exactly using height and waist only there might be multiple parameters so this is only two uh, there are only two parameters but there can be three parameters as well so the clustering will happen in 3d space like you'll have instead of circles you will have square uh, spheres over there like in the 3d space and if it is only 1D space, so it's like you have some points over here, some points over here, so yeah. So cl for clustering, you need at least one feature. You can do it in 2D space or 3D space where you have feature 1, feature 2, feature 3 and so on. And so on. Like it can be uh, any ND space, like it can be 100 such features as well, like height, uh, waist, size, uh, anything. So, yeah, this was uh, the basic idea about cluster analysis and it has multiple applications. So, there are two ways like uh, in which clustering can be done. One is supervised way. and other is unsupervised way so supervised way of clustering is when you know the data labels for example there is a, a machine learning classification algorithm called linear discriminant analysis or linear discriminant in short so let's say oops sorry Let's say you have uh, data points and they may not be very clearly separated. Okay, what linear discriminant analysis tries to do, you have, you know the labels of these data points actually, like these are X's and these are O's. So it tries to uh, find a cluster boundary such that the within a uh, class distance is or they call uh, sorry between class variance they call it uh, between class variance which is like the difference in the means it's maximized this is maximized and within class variance is minimized okay so they try to find such boundary which will separate out the two classes so this is used for the classification task like if you have to uh, like for instance like i am using it for classifying dna sequences so i get feature representation for dna sequences of different species like species one will have certain dna uh, uh, sequences and i am getting certain representation feature representation for that species two will have certain representation and species three will have certain representation in certain space so what linear discriminant analysis tries to do, it tries to find the boundary between S1 and uh, S3 and S2. So it tries to learn uh, these boundaries 
based on the data given to you and their labels. So this is the supervised way of clustering data and finding the linear boundaries to uh, classify them. So, so let's say I have uh, one new unseen DNA sequence. I want to see which category it belongs to. So if it lies over here, we can see that it, it is belonging to this S1 category and so on. So that is the supervised way of doing it. You have certain sort of supervision or like you have labels associated. But what if I just want to find out the patterns in the data as we discussed over here in the case of uh, finding the size of the t-shirt uh, or whatever cloth you have. So depending on the data, you just say like you want to have four clusters or four different sizes. So you will have four clusters based on this. Let's say if I were to say like if I, I want to have five clusters. So for this data, uh, if, I, if I say I, I want to have two clusters, I can cluster this, this visually, randomly. It depends on the initialization. We'll see it in the k-means clustering algorithm in the next week, like how this cluster has changed depending on the initial initialization. Okay, and uh, let's say if I want to have four clusters, so you might end up having these four clusters over here. So it depends on the size of uh, yeah size of uh, clothes in demand. Exactly. So. Yeah, so whatever different sizes of clothes are needed or whatever uh, entities are needed, you can decide the number of clusters accordingly. So that was all about the basics of cluster analysis. And let me see if I have missed anything. Okay, we'll see some questions and then we'll stop. And if anything is left, we'll discuss it in the next class. Uh, by the way, I'll be sharing this Python notebook with you. There are certain functions uh, uh, that I have not discussed. So chi square for chi square, there were different functions I have used over here. Like uh, there was chi two as well available in the scipy dot stats model, and I have also used this chi square function. So uh, like from scipy dot stats, uh, chi square is also available, and chi two is also available. So you can use uh, these functions differently, like as in uh, in the case of linear regression also we saw that we had this OLS as well as linear regression both different functions doing the same job. So yeah there are multiple functions for the same task uh, but the number the, the way the parameters are passed are a bit different. So just uh, look into it. I'll share this notebook with you and you can play around with it later. So let us go on to the questions. Okay let me uh, share uh, the tab. Okay, so the first question is state true or false. I hope the screen is visible. Chi 2 goodness of fit compares uh, expected theoretical frequencies of categories from a population distribution to the observed actual frequencies from a distribution to determine whether there is a difference between that what was expected and what was observed. Okay, what about others? Yeah, please try to answer everyone. Okay, fine. So the answer is true. Uh, we are trying to find out whether the actual, uh, like uh, the expected frequencies and the observed frequencies are, uh, whether there is a difference between these two or not. If there is no dif uh, uh, difference, which means that uh, the given uh, data fits the give, uh, given distribution into consideration like whatever distribution for the uh, for example we saw Poisson distribution so we are computing the expected frequencies for the Poisson distribution we were given the observed frequencies and we were trying to find out using chi-square statistic whether uh, the there is a difference between the expected one and the observed one so if there is no difference which means that the given data follows that particular distribution so the answer over here is true the number of degrees of freedom uh, for the appropriate chi-square distribution in a test of independence is yeah 
So it was straightforward answer. Number of rows minus one into number of columns minus one. And what will be the case in the case of uh, chi-square test, uh, goodness of fit test? What will be the degrees of freedom? Yeah, that is k minus p minus one or k minus one minus p. Uh, the same thing. Okay. So in order to not violate uh, the requirements necessary to use chi-square distribution, each frequency in a goodness of fit test must be. We saw this just now. So it should be at least five. Then uh, the chi-square test of independence is used to analyze the frequencies of two variables with multiple categories and determine whether they are independent. Okay, uh, what about the others? I see only two people answering. Okay, so the correct answer is true. Chi-square test of independence, like you have been given two uh, different variables, and the variables can take uh, uh, any values. Like for example, the geographic region A, B, C, D, E, F, and the financial investment and so on. So these were the two variables. Geographic region was one variable, or like for example, student motivation and gender. So gender was one variable which was taking different category, which was having different categories, uh, 0, 1, like male, female, and uh, student motivation was like 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So uh, you have like two variables having multiple categories, and we are trying to determine whether the two variables are independent or not. So for that, we are using this chi square test of independence. In order to perform the chi-square test to check the uh, independence in Python using SciPy, uh, we import so uh, Ravi, the, the first question that we saw that was relating to chi-square goodness of fit test and this question, the previous question was relating to chi-square independence test, test of independence. So in this case, uh, what will be, what about the others? Okay. So the correct answer is C, chi-square contingency. We saw this in uh, collab notebook. Okay. Okay. I think I have missed one point. The distance matrix okay let me go back to ipad now so we'll uh, see this in like the distance matrix will be needed later for clustering analysis so there are multiple ways in which you can find distance between two points the simplest way let's say i have uh, x axis so the distance between two points will be let's say this is x1 x2 so it will be x1 minus x2 okay and the me uh, absolute distance like not like the negative so it can be negative as well uh, depending on whatever value you are getting you, whether you are doing x2 minus x1 or so on so we are concerned about only the absolute distance okay this was one this is one distance measure and if i want to find the average distance of a point from other points so how can i do that it can be found so you have this value so if you want to find the average distance of uh, 
this point with respect to all the points or the dispersion in the point there is something called as mean absolute deviation or mad where in case this particular data point you are seeing is the mean of all the data points and you are trying to find the dispersion in them so it will be like these are x1 x2 x3 x4 and so on you are trying to find xi minus and this is x mean say mu x mu divided by n so this is the dispersion that you are finding which is very similar to the standard deviation but uh, sorry uh, variance the difference between variance and this particular measure is or standard deviation is computed as under root of x summation xi minus x mu square or mean square not uh, x mu i am just uh, it it is generally denoted as mu upon n or n minus 1 in case it is like a uh, sample data okay so it can also be written as xi minus mu square upon n raised to 1 by 2 and this particular entity over here it can be written as xi minus mu divided by n absolute difference only 1 by 1 ok uh, can you explain that 1 by 1 thing it is actually uh, 1 by 1 is 1 so it is x minus xi minus mu by n hmm. summation sorry Okay, but why did we put that one by one over there? Like? I'll come to that. I'll I'll come to that. Okay. So in general way, you can compute uh, the distance at different degrees as x minus mu raised to p divided uh, raised to 1 by p. So, if p equal to 2, it is called as Euclidean distance, whatever you are computing over here. Uh, we generally, uh, the, this is ignored, like you are just interested in this sum and not the number of data points. So, this is the Euclidean distance. computed of uh, data points with respect to the mean ok and ok let me go to the slides Uh, professor has talk ab talked about standardization and all. Uh, I am not sure if I will be able to cover that, but standardization is like you have data points in a space, you try uh, to bring them to a space where the mean is not visible. Oh, sorry, 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 my bad. Yeah, so standardization of data points is like uh, you have data points in certain space which are having certain values, say in 2D space, and uh, uh, you want to bring them. Uh, to another space where the mean is 0 and standard deviation is 1. So, that is basically you are computing the z scores like xi minus mu by sigma. So, uh, yeah, please go into look into that. Like, there are benefits of doing standardization, and in certain cases, it may not be expected. So, yeah, I will skip that part for now and let me just go to the distance metric. Yeah. So, in this case, 
So, the Euclidean distance over here as we see uh, like saw in the formula it is the summation of the square of the differences divided by uh, sorry uh, square root of that summation okay and that is nothing but this particular distance over here the hypotenuse of this triangle. Now there is something called as uh, Manhattan distance. So it comes from the uh, uh, name of a city in the US Manhattan and uh, the city is such that like all the roads are like uh, uh, almost at uh, 90 degrees to each other and the thing is like if you if you want uh, this particular uh, fire truck to reach uh, any other any place in the city you will either have to go upward like uh, eastwards uh, northwards or eastwards and other way around like westwards or southwards so to come uh, like the direct distance euclidean distance the shortest distance between a and b will be the euclidean distance that you have over here but you may not be able to find that out uh, you may, you may uh, like the car may not be able to go directly over here uh, so the you will have to follow such path over here so for this you compute the distance called Manhattan distance but this, this is nothing but uh, the summation of these distances over here this x1 xi1 minus xj1 xi2 minus xj2 so I will have to see the notations over here Okay. Uh, actually, in that Manhattan example, all the lines, the red line, blue line, and the yellow line, yeah, all, are all, equal, these are, all are equal. All are equal. Yeah. So these are the Manhattan distances. These are equal. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the difference between the Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance is that Euclidean distance is the shortest path that you can have between any two points in a given space, and Manhattan distance is like the restricted uh, path that you have. Okay. And there is one more distance called Mahalanobis distance. I'm not sure if professor has covered it in this uh, uh, particular course. Okay, uh, but yeah, let it be. So whatever I showed you earlier, uh, the general formula for this xi1 minus xj1 raised to p and so on. So this general formula is called as Minkowski distance. And if you substitute P as 1 over here, you will end up getting Manhattan distance. And if P is equal to 2, you will get Euclidean distance. Uh, in general, they have given this modulus over here, uh, which may not be necessary for uh, like Euclidean distance case, but uh, this is a general formula that works for Manhattan as well as Euclidean. And it is called as Minkowski distance. This is just for your information. And it is also called LP metric by other name. Okay, uh, let me check if there is any other thing. So we'll see this particular why these distance measures are being discussed over here. You will get to know during the K-means clustering that we'll be discussing in the next class. Uh, yeah. So let me go back to the slides. So which of the following properties satis satisfied? Uh, so, there are certain uh, properties all these distance metrics uh, need to follow and one obvious thing is distance cannot be less than 0, it can be 0 or more than 0 and second thing is, okay, that is the answer over here, like uh, what do you think will be uh, the correct option for this, which of the following properties satisfied by the Euclidean metric and the Manhattan metric of a distance function for all the objects i, j and h. No, distance can be 0. So, distance between the point uh, with itself, like a distance of point with itself is 0. So, that can be the case. Distance cannot be negative. So, first uh, option is ruled out and distance between any two points will always be 
the shorter will always be shorter like uh, distance of ij yeah that's the triangle inequality that's true so if you go from i to j directly that is shorter compared to going from i to h and then from h to j so part c is also uh, uh, not the correct option so the correct answer is distance of ij is equal to distance of j i so distance of a point with another point is same as distance of another point with that particular uh, the first point so that is these are the properties of distance matrix that you need to know like distance ij will always be greater than equal to zero it can be zero distance ij will be always less than or equal to distance ih plus distance hj when it will be equal when h lies between i and j on the line of line connecting i and j so ih plus hj will be distance ij if h is lying on the line ij if it is lying uh, if it is not lying on the line then it will always be greater than so this particular part is incorrect it will be distance ij will be less than equal to distance ih plus distance hj and this is true okay so manhattan distance is also known as it is clear from the fact yeah so it is also known as city block distance what is the minimum number of features required to perform clustering yeah so we saw this also we need at least one feature to do clustering minkowski distance is a generalization of both euclidean and manhattan matrix yeah and this is also true let x1 equal to this and x2 equal to this so on find the euclidean distance and manhattan distance between these two so this is a theoretical question and you can find out the answer yourself later okay discriminant analysis does not require the grouping uh, variable to be known at the beginning yeah so we need to know the labels of the grouping variables so the answer is false so yeah that's it for today like if you have any queries uh, please let me know in the next class we'll discuss them uh, i just have uh, one uh, question regarding the assignment they had a question on k mean clustering but i don't think they taught that in week 10 uh it was not taught in week 10 uh, it is covered in week 11 actually but they did have a question on that so i don't know should we raise a complaint for that or what because i got that answer wrong oh is it yeah then definitely you can uh yeah you can raise a complaint that uh, it was not supposed to be in week 10 so but did they release the week 11 uh, before that particular con like uh, they usually do but uh, i am lagging behind now like on every sunday i am watching all the videos and then uh, attempting the questions i see i see so, okay then maybe you can raise a complaint on the forum uh, Mm -hmm. I'm not very really sure how they uh, like if they will respond fast, but yeah, definitely just put it over there on the forum. Uh, I will request the others also to raise a similar question because if I alone put it over there, then nothing will happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely, yeah, you can definitely put it over there on the forum. And uh, let's see what uh, they say. Like I'm not a, a regular uh, pers like team member of this particular course, so yeah, I may not be able to uh, answer your query. But yeah, definitely, yeah. others will be able to look into it okay thank you thank you thank you everyone for joining uh thanks for the session also uh, thank you okay thank you thank you everyone